Oh god, oh god, oh god, what am I gonna do? First I cut Nick June short, now I'm down a Cartoon Network! Uh, oh god, uh, the hub? June? No, the My Little Pony game's too new. Uh, Fox June? No, Hidden Run deserves better. Nick Jr.? Oh god, it's the perfect name, but all those games are for babies! I can't show my audience how to count! Wait. Oh god. Have I really sunk that low? Are things really that dire? Dire they are, all right, fine. Time to break the glass. Back in the... You see, I... Uh... Chicken Little, why do you want me to do this one so bad? Just short of him. I've never gotten more requests to make a video than I have for the next Chicken Little game. What have I done for multiple hundreds of people to ask me to play a game that acts as a sequel to a movie that nobody liked following up on an at most three minute joke from the end of the movie, the part of the movie where families are piling into their cars to talk about their favorite parts, which for this movie was dead silence. I said don't suggest this video. Don't! I don't claim to have an explanation for people's taste, but what I do claim to have is a video about it. I mean, you're watching it right now after all. So the game starts at... What? Listen, I know I went into the histories of the channels with the last two of these, but, uh, it, 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 this is a little different, you know. Cartoon Network was around since 1992, Nickelodeon 1977, Disney 1923, that's 98 years! Do you really expect or even want 98 years of movie, television, and theme park history summarized all as a lead into the sequel to Chicken Little? Because uh, I do, I have it right here. So Disney was actually founded by a man named Walt DreamWorks, who along with his brother Roy Disney started Disney Brothers Cartoon Studios in California in 1923. Together the pair worked to create- Listen, we're talking 98 years here. You can make a whole Duke Nukem forever in that time. There are just some parts that aren't as interesting as others. You'll thank me later. And thus, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves was released. The first feature-length animated film ever made. If you don't count El Pastolo in 1917, or Creation in 1915, or The Adventures of Prince Achmed in 1926, or Paludopolis in 1931, The Tales of the Fox in 1937. But if you don't count those, it was a trailblazer! This film ushered in the golden age of Disney animation. Animation. In America, feature-length animated films had never been attempted or fully accepted up until this point, and as such, Disney had the run of it, releasing classic films like Pinocchio, Dumbo, Bambi, and Fantasia. These good times would continue as... Why do these guys not just buzz off? Seriously, they're really starting to tick me off a bit. So Disney was at war, or rather, the animators were. Disney's staff was massively cut thanks to the Second World War, and as such, their style of filmmaking had to change. Making films like Bambi and Snow White was pretty much impossible with the staff they had on hand, but Fantasia might have had the answer. See, this wasn't the Golden Age anymore. This was the Package Era, where films were just collections of shorts presented with a very loose through line. Anyone up for a a tall glass and make my music? No, yeah, everybody says that. However, once they drew Donald Duck hugging the Statue of Liberty in his America-themed pajamas, the war was over and they could get back to work. This brought about the Silver Age of films like Peter Pan, Cinderella, Lady and the Tramp, and The Jungle Book. However, it was during the process of making the bungle joke that the man behind it all, Walt DreamWorks, sadly passed away. Hold the fort. He hated Jews. And by the next movie, they were just black cauldroning everywhere. It was embarrassing. This is what happens when your main figurehead kicks the bucket and you start hot potatoing the leadership around to anyone who will look at you funny. Without that strong vision at the top, films like Oliver and Company, The Rescuers, Robin Hood, while awakening just about everything it could in kids who watched it, flopped hard at the box office. Disney was straight up eating dirt throughout all of the 70s and most of the 80s. It got so bad that management straight up kicked the animators out of the studio and locked the doors till they got better at animating. So the gang got back together and decided to hit the in case of getting bad at animating break glass button and started work on their first proper princess fairy tale in years. 
The Little Mermaid. This movie was a rousing success and ushered in the Disney Renaissance. Now, you could say that every film released from 1989 to 1999 was solid gold, but every Renaissance has some hangers on. Rescuers Down Under, get out! After that mouse sized hurdle was masterpiece after masterpiece. You have Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King, Hunchback of Notre Dame, Tarzan, Hercules, Mulan, and yes, well, Pocahontas is. Pocahontas and you can't really remove the Rosie O'Donnell 8 from Tarzan, that doesn't take away from just how good Disney was getting. They had to rework how the Oscars work just to not recognize Disney for how good they were doing. And then those pencil neck geeks had to go and show them that they can make cartoons with the computer. Disney released their magnum opus on February 10th, 2004 when they released the Lion King one and a half bonus DVD containing Who Wants to Be King of the Jungle, Timon and Pumbaa's Virtual Safari, and that stupid light game no ever played. This was released as a make good to the fans of the studio after they briefly forgot how to make movies. 2000 started the real end of the Disney hot streak. Fantasia 2000 wasn't dynamite, but dinosaur is something else. This was the first real sign of trouble. Pixar was constantly advancing animation in a direction that Disney wasn't exactly ready for. These 3D graphics might not age as well as the 2D animated movies from around the same time, but they were something that had never been seen up until that point. Uh, compare the offerings of companies like Pixar or DreamWorks or even smaller ones like Blue Sky. They were either all in on 3D animation or quickly learning that 2D was on its way out. That may sound like an indictment on traditional animation, but it really isn't. It's just an analysis of what films people were going to see at the time. Movies like Ice Age, Shrek, and Toy Story 2 were big successes. Well, Titan AE, Iron Giant, and Treasure Planet weren't. So Disney just had to get on the CGI bandwagon and we all be groovy, right? Well, not quite, because that thing where they still didn't know what they were doing was in full swing. Not only did it take them until 2005 to start releasing 3D animated movies, but they also didn't start making good ones for another five years. Not just that, but they were also working on destroying the reputations of movies that people actually liked by releasing low-quality directed DVD sequels. I wasn't talking about you, babe. I meant everybody else. So for most of the time where I was personally alive, I spent it getting really excited for Pixar movies and the opposite of excited for Disney movies. There were still good movies, obviously it's not like everybody's brain fell out at the exact same time, but there was still an unignorable shift in the vast quantity of quality. If you don't eat your home on the range, then you don't get any Meet the Robinsons for dessert. However, you may have noticed the lack of news of Disney dying during this period. In fact, you may have read the news about them currently planning on buying you. They're just closing the deal with your parents right now. Disney was not only not in danger during this period, I think they're in a position to never be in danger again. They have more money than most nations, and not the small ones you can't point to on a map. I'm saying they could probably swing buying Finland if they put their backs into it. They have a theme park that counts for most of the population of Florida, bought the rights to Jar Jar Binks, Beta Ray Bill, and Mo Sislak, and are currently on the brand new hot streak of films. Tangled, Wreck-It Ralph, Frozen, Big Hero 6, Zootopia, Moana. No, not that one. No, not that one. No, not that one. No, not that one and in Kanto. Now Disney sits in kind of a weird position of being less an entertainment company and more so an official fourth branch of the US government having a direct impact on laws like extending copyright so they can't let the 1000 Mickey Mouse dating simulators waiting to be released come out when the copyright expires or making sure that gay people can't live their lives happily. For a company with two dozen first ever LGBT characters, you'd think they'd figure out what they were doing, but no, you really let Cyclops cop from onward down Disney for shit. Game. The next part is going to show why exactly we had to skim over most of the history of Disney, because this next part is only a fraction of their history, and it's gonna take a while. So what exactly was the cause of Disney's downswing come the 2000s? Well, pretty much every change in that regard came from the fact that Disney was currently being piloted by an evil Dutch pirate captain from the 1600s. Michael Eisner is most famous for being the personal punching bag of Defunct Land, but he's actually not a cartoon character like you may think. He was actually Disney's president from 1980 to 2005, which makes him the guy who was at the helm for both its fall, its rise, and its even bigger fall. In the beginning, he was a savvy businessman who expertly pulled the strings to put Disney in a position to become the media empire it is today. By the end, he was a blind guy wildly swinging around a sledgehammer around an orphanage in the darkest reenactment of a Gallagher bit you've ever seen. He and his friend Jeffrey Katzenberg would enter Disney in 1984 and turn things around by using a combination of enthusiasm, creative freedom, and work ethic to turn around the films, make deals to 
secure massive TV conglomerates in ABC and ESPN and make the highest grossing Broadway thing of all time because yeah, why not? It's only like the third or fourth most impressive thing they did this decade. However, peaches and cream, this wasn't as in addition to all the good things, there were bad like pushing out Jeffrey Katzenberg in such an ugly breakup that he ended up making Shrek out of spite. Michael also massively bungled the launch of California Adventure and publicly executed the concept of magic in Europe with Euro Disneyland. And worst of all, he majorly screwed up Disney's last good thing. See, Steve Jobs, one of the heads of Pixar, was negotiating for a better deal with Disney. In this time where you were constantly stepping in Brother Bear, Pixar was making Disney a lot of money. Some could even say that they were dependent on them. Looking to sweeten the deal because of it, Jobs and Eisner got into a shouting match that ultimately led to Pixar looking for a new distributor. This was DEFCON 1. If they kept making Atlantis the Lost Empires without the safety net of cars, they were in massive trouble. Company ending amounts of trouble. So Disney had one goal, make the next movie a hit. They needed to show Pixar that they could do just fine without them. If they didn't make a hit, they would lose massive bargaining power when it came to getting their contract back. If the film flopped, Pixar could fleece them for everything they were worth after proving that they were nothing without them. The movie that all that hope was pinned on? Oh, f Chicken Little needed to be good. It needed to make money. And the money it made? $300 million. Is it good? Is it bad? I cannot tell with film sometimes. Okay, by Disney standards, amazing. This was the most money a film had made since Dinosaurs, which is a worse Chicken Little, so it's amazing, people. Pop the champagne, boys. We did it. By Pixar standards, this was a dismal toilet fire. Horrible reviews made less than any of their movies did and generally regarded as a mess. So the movie didn't bomb, but it didn't make all the money in the world, so neither side really had an advantage. Which actually meant that Disney had the advantage since they got to deal with Pixar, which let them further expand to buy Marvel, Star Wars, Fox, all that stuff. So if you look at it from this perspective, Chicken Little is the most important movie Disney has ever made. From every other perspective, it sucks. But that still doesn't answer question numero uno. Why does this game exist? Well, Chicken Little being the company's first hit in almost half a decade made them trigger happy to start doing even more with it. And that involved a sequel that never happened, a TV show that never happened, and a game which... Shut up! Ace in Action was the only part of this plan for expansion that ever actually took form. Thank God! But it's here! It exists! It feels like it fell out of an alternate dimension and now it's time to actually play it. So before anything, the presentation of this game is bizarre. Not the graphics, I mean how the game is actually given to you. You're not playing a game about the movie. You're playing a game about Chicken Little and his gaggle of mooks playing a game about the movie. That means not only are there cutscenes to show how Chicken Little is enjoying the game, but they do running a commentary over the whole thing. Along with the other characters you play as, that means there are at any time six characters screaming in your ear at any given moment. It's already weird, but it gets weirder when you realize they got Zack Braff back to reprise his role as Chicken Little from the movie. I mean, it's nice, but I can just imagine somebody waking up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night thinking, when was the last time I gave Zach Braff money? In the actual game, you start out with the biggest positive we have going for us, and that's that Adam West is back to voice Ace. This man is a national treasure, and any opportunity to hear him talk is one eye treasure. First thing we do in the game is head off to Pluto after its planetary prison gets sieged, so we send the expendable crew members to go check it out. Oh, very funny, guys. So before we get into the whole moving around thing, we need to talk about something very, very weird. This game's mouse sensitivity is bananas. I set it to max, and the best I'm getting is having to whip my mouse over and over again to look around at a snail's pace. The best solution I found was to open my own computer settings and up the mouse sensitivity to maximum. That was until I did a little sleuthing and found out if I wanted to fix it, I'd have to open my radon control panel, which I've never done before, and cap the game's frame rate. This is because the game was trying to output at 2,000 frames per second. It's such a common problem that the Steam forums for this game just talk about how to fix it. When I saw that as a potential fix, I scoffed and said, oh yeah, sure, that'll work, to which it was then thrown back into my face. I didn't figure this out until World 2, so just understand that when we get 
right there, my wrist was seconds from snapping and my mouse pad now had tire tracks on it. So the gameplay is oddly enough like a Ratchet and Clank. You have a laser blaster, a grenade launcher, a jetpack, and a dodge roll, which cannot dodge anything. Ace's movement is standard, but at the same time, when the last game put you in charge of an RC car with a busted wheel, I'll take tank controls, to be honest. The main problem really is in how Ace is so slow. It's a good speed for combat since you can move around without worrying about flying off the platforms, but when trying to get somewhere fast, it's maddening. I mean, except when the game decides to speed up for no reason at total random and then go back to the exact same speed not a few seconds later, I'm not complaining, honestly. I'd probably still be walking to the end of the first level if I didn't have it. Speaking of that first level, it's a standard run and gun level just to get you used to the controls. These rooms with the lasers, though, show off how the mouse sensitivity bug really bugs me as I have to take cover just to turn around. At the end, we trip the prison's defense sequence and have to call in backup. We also see the challenges the game has, like beating levels in a certain amount of time, destroying these communication orbs, and finding all the bonus mega acorns. Whereas in the last game, collecting acorns only got you extra lives, this time acorns can be used to upgrade your weapons. You can not only enhance your gun to have new properties, but also get new sub-weapons and extra shields. It's a massive improvement since it feels like there's actually something worth collecting in the game, even if they are note-for-note -note bolts from Ratchet and Clank. Dying too is a much bigger consequence since instead of just losing a life, you lose the acorns you need for upgrades. All in all, the actual grind through Ace's levels is pretty fun. I definitely see what people meant when they said that this was a Ratchet and Clank clone, but I don't think that's exactly a bad thing. Uh, luckily, this is more Ratchet Deadlock than All for One. You may have noticed that I said Ace levels. That's because you don't just play as him. Returning from the last game, game is multiple playstyles. Whereas the last game had as many playstyles as there are species of Beetle, this game limits it to three. The next one we deal with is Abby, who flies around in a spaceship. She controls pretty well, her levels are all open, and her movement is free-flowing enough to let you take advantage of the space. She controls more like a hovercraft than a spaceship, but I'd much rather it move like this as opposed to the spaceship levels in the last game. Her level is nothing too special, all you gotta do is get from one end of the level to the other and blow up the three control towers and we're done. It's probably my least favorite of the three control schemes, but I'd happily take it over playing the baseball game again. After Abby disables the shields, we need to send in Runt to let Ace move forward. The final control scheme is controlling Runt's tank. <laughs> this might actually be my favorite. You're so massive that most small arms fire just bounces off of you, and your guns and missiles are so strong that stuff that it would take Ace and Abby minutes to destroy takes you a second. Not just that, but the tank itself is super fast, gets a dash upgrade later on to make it even faster, and controls like a dream. After playing his levels in the last game with gritted teeth, Runt gets to be the best part of this one. After this level, we gotta check back in with Chicken Little and his friends. You know what society's been missing? Game Games about gamers. How am I supposed to relate? Why don't you ever ask me to play? Because girls don't like playing video games. <laughs> up next and we gotta fly into action to support. This level isn't as wide open like the last one. You gotta take things nice and slow, blow up some watchtowers, duck and dive between hanging bridges, and use the new mine repulsor for yet undiscovered purposes. After you get through there, we finally get to the next ace level. Thank goodness, I haven't gotten my cootie booster shot, so I was in a lot of danger. First thing we do in this level is meet the fourth hidden gameplay style. I've got a nosebleed coming on. My doctor says I can't handle many more play styles. This is the matching color hacking minigame. Shoot the right color at the right tumbler at the right time for the right result, which is winning. These sections show up a lot in ace levels from now on, and the most I'll say is that it can be very persnickety on which counts as hitting the tumbler, as in sometimes hitting is missing and missing is hitting. This level is all about getting to the center of the prison so we can find Foxy Loxy's prison cell. You know, just to make sure she's still there. This level throws tons of enemies at you in tight spaces with no way to escape besides running away. That and it has lasers with perfect accuracy where it's not a matter of if you can dodge it, more how little damage can you take. After that, we skillfully trip the alarm and send the prison back into lockdown. Luckily, all we have to do is destroy this big alarm system to shut it down. Pro tip, killing yourself does not disable the alarm. Repeat, killing yourself is not the answer. This section isn't hard, more so boring for how you need to keep climbing the elevator to the top level, then throw a grenade, then you're in the clear. After that is a battle arena, and another battle arena, after which is another battle arena where you have to run through these tight trap-filled hallways all the way to the end of the level. Except in your way is the same generator again, not even 10 minutes after fighting the last one. No new tricks, no different attacks, just fan service 
Christmas for all the people clamoring for the return of the best character in the game, the alarm system. Well, worry no more, guys. It's back. It's gone. Once we finish that, we come face to face with Foxy Loxy. Oh, 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 somebody's been watching too much Robin Hood. This design cannot be made by a holy man. The person who modeled this is a danger to society. Where are her organs? Her intestine must be the size of a shoestring. Which is weirder. The fact that for the game, they made Chicken Little's middle school bully the villain or that they made her hot. And this is a question for both the in-universe developers and Avalanche Games. This is your fault. So after giving everybody who's on the edge about becoming a furry a little something to think about, she reprograms the warden's tank and tries to kill us. So Run's gotta use his tank to try to destroy it without killing the warden. This is the first boss in the game and it's nothing special. Its attacks aren't that strong. It sends waves of weak enemies between phases and we just gotta shoot the engine on the back of it to explode the tank and the warden inside, uh, but in a pacifist's way. Back at the ship and we figure out something's going down at the rings of Saturn at Dank Laboratories and we go off to find them. Not before getting some delightfully 2006 white boy beatboxing and hilarious runt jokes. Listen guys, I said I liked your parts of the game. Please stop trying to make me regret saying it. On to Saturn and this level is when I finally realized that something was up. It's an escort mission with your mothership while you protect it with Abby's ship. Just blob the enemy hangers to progress. The mothership isn't completely defenseless so it's not like you need to babysit it, but it takes one of the only advantages of the Abbey levels that you can get them done and over with quickly and stretches it out over the course of 10 minutes. I realized something may have been up after the enemies stopped attacking and the mothership stopped moving. Only the mothership can destroy the bunker so as it stands I can't actually do anything. This is another problem that the 2000 FPS caused and it takes me three tries before realizing that the game is just a technical mess on PC. There is not a chance I'm playing a shooter on console so I just keep plugging away before finally capping the frame rate and getting on with my life. The dogfight style of the level is a lot more fun than what we've played previously, but unless you know it's broken going in, it's gonna be an unbearable roadblock. After that, we get a new gameplay style. I feel the blood gushing. One more of these and I think the video's ending early. This is a turret section. Oh, calm down, calm down. I know we're all very excited. This game really puts you in the shoes of a space pig. This is what I always imagined it'd be like up there. Anyway, I will not be an accessory to giving a turret section the time of day, so we're moving on to the next ace level. Here we have to track down Sleazel Weasel in his factory. A new type of enemy gets added that can only be hit when its shell opens, but when it does, it sends out shockwaves. It makes combat a lot more engaging by just making it so you can't run directly forward into the enemies and win. After an unreasonable amount of hacking sections, we teleport deeper into the factory with a wide open battle arena, followed by another battle arena and uh, four more individual battle arenas after that. This level may feel like it's going on forever, and it is, but you're rewarded at the end with a battle arena. Wait for it? With instant kill explosives all over the place. Okay, now you can applaud. The last battle arena is less a regular arena and more of a timed challenge. Just survive for two minutes against basic enemies and a battleship before you get picked up. I'd really like a few more runt missions from now on, because if the next couple levels are like that one, where the game's definition of speedrunning is 25 minutes, I don't want to come back for a while. Well, my prayers have been answered as a runt level is up next, and it's where we get the battering ram. It gives you a brief boost in whichever direction you're facing and recharges fast, so you can use it as a way to get through long stretches of the level in a flash. For this level, we just gotta take down three shields generators, which does involve using the turret again, but thankfully for never more than a few seconds at a time. It's a quick dash all around the level from generator to generator, but they put honest-to-goodness level design into those paths, giving you plenty to shoot at and super accurate turret towers that can shred through your health. It was also the first time I was ever actually worried about my health, but you move fast enough and can always outmaneuver the enemies no matter how fast they are. After that level, we get another cutscene only for Chicken Little, not the in-game Chicken Little, the in-game, not in-game Chicken Little, to try to skip it. He heard how much I said I liked the cutscenes. He's trying to make the game worse. Time for another Abbey level where we gotta stop the fuel being shipped to Foxy. This is another Abbey level without much room to breathe, room for error, but it's got a heck of a lot of room for improvement. Oh! It does have some pretty clever puzzles to blow up the fuel, like waiting till the barrels are in the scanners and then blowing them both up, but like the other Abbey levels, it's just kind of slow and boring, especially when it's indoors. After that is a really tense ace level where we have to go room to room to destroy all the invisible enemies inside. Once you do, you only have so much time before the room blows up and you're killed instantly. With how slow ace moves and all the bombs littered along the ground after the enemies bite the dust, it's a real nail biter to get out in time, especially with how many enemies wait for you on the outside and the ground collapsing around you. Even worse is when you have to fight battleships on foot with just a blaster. In the previous levels, you have a spaceship and a tank to take these things out, but now we got a winning personality. Once you blow up the last fuel room, you catch up to Sleazel Weasel and have to chase him along the fins of a 
broken propeller. Once you manage to get to him, he runs past you and tries to drop both you and the fin, and just like before, you have to make it back in time. Except this time, there's a near comedic amount of enemies in your way trying to stop you. The last fin even takes away five seconds and I barely make it. After the last ace level took up half my playtime so far, this one went much smoother. Turns out Sleazel has sold 200 billion tons of fuel to Foxy onto Mars, and the planet is completely overrun with violent vegetation. If this were Fallout New Vegas, I'd be pulling out my famous move of pissing myself and crying, but I think I'll be much more collected here. The first mission is on the ground in the tank, and it definitely got me nervous that these collectibles are out in the open like this. I'm about to have my lunch money stolen, aren't I? This level introduces the Hover, a function that lets the tank cross over lava and acid. It's a feature so convenient that even the characters in the game point out how little sense it makes that I didn't have this earlier. I bet with this hover I can get across lava and those other toxic substances. Uh, Commander, this plant's nuts. Uh, I'm scared. I want my blankie. I want to go home. All right, thank you. Over. The hover controls are ever so slightly more floaty when floating fitting, but it does mess with you when you have to quickly go back and forth from land to floating and then back to land. This level is more standard tank fare with the ability to get collectibles when you boost off certain ramps for airtime. There are a lot more spots where standard enemies can deal big damage, but as long as you keep up with upgrading your health, you should stay just fine. Once we get in far enough, we drop off Ace Frame to infiltrate the base on foot. The main gimmick of this part of the stage is that these gates need to be turned on at these panels that you only have so much time to pass through before they close. That and the floors being electrified mean you have to do precise platforming to survive. Tension gets ratcheted up quite a bit more when these big laser walls replace the standard beams. What you're supposed to do is hide under these manholes to avoid them, but I've never entered a manhole, so I stayed far away. And I'm also just kind of dumb. Now we get an upgrade for Ace, which lets him climb up certain walls. Just like the Mine Repulsor and Battering Ram, these can be used in previous levels to help you get to stuff you couldn't before. I don't think I've really had a moment to just mention what a massive improvement this game is. Avalanche only made one other game between the Chicken Littles, and it sucked. It was called 25 to Life, and in in less than a year, they went from a below average platformer to a pretty good running gun game. Is it even possible for that to happen? Uh, yes? How the f is that possible? So the game shows my face into the carpet and says, This! This is how you're supposed to do the mother puzzle before we finish out the level this video does not contain nearly enough of how much of the stupid hacking minigame there is in the ace levels i mean it if we have to stop a fleeing freighter filled with foliage from escaping by shooting out the engines i think this is meant to be hard but by the time i get to the first checkpoint it's practically already dead they expected that to take nine minutes we get another scene of chicken little trying to stay on the gamer's edge when a foul foul tries to tempt him with their feminine wiles luckily chicken little is a gamer and that has dulled him to all the female tricks like genuine affection and kindness look i just want to blow stuff up oh, men sounds it seems that the next level will have more than enough gaming kryptonite it's an escort level fish needs to scan all the stuff left over on the surface so runt has to escort him around He's mainly scanning one pile of junk in the center of the stage, so I go out to find all the collectibles and leave him to get blasted into scrap metal and chum! Little did I know that he would also start going around to the other sites I was visiting after a little bit, so I may have jumped the gun. Can you blame me? Obviously, yes. Well, while we wait for Fish to do boring stuff that nobody enjoys, I want to talk about the actual presentation. I haven't mentioned it yet, but this game has unreal art direction. The attention to detail in this world is super fun and interesting. All of your vehicles and weapons are animal-themed. Enemies are themed after farmers, and their own vehicles are animal-themed. The mothership is a big barn. The guard towers on the Pluto level are meant to look like dogs. Turrets look like mice. There is way too much effort going into making this world feel fully realized and lived in. All the character designs are really exaggerated and stylized and remind you of that old pulpy space novel art style, which is fitting given the inspiration. The voice acting as well is great. I don't exactly care for the main voices of Little, Abby, and Runt, but their in-game counterparts are fantastic. Getting to listen to Adam West for a whole game is a blast, and it sounds like they trapped him in a room and said, you're not getting out until you act more than any human being has ever acted before. I've got to show these vile vultures of villainy that I mean business. Nice alliteration, sir. Thank you. On the subject of the voice acting, though, this game shares one of Chicken Little's worst traits. Nobody ever shuts the f*** 
up! Characters constantly feel the need to be talking. They can't ever let dead air be dead. If it's not the characters in the game talking, it's Chicken Little and company talking about the game, making the most surface level gamer jokes you've ever heard. It's like it was written by Dorkly. I wanted so badly to turn off the voices, but there was a more than 0% chance that Adam West was gonna say something and I didn't want a chance missing it. It doesn't help, however, that there's a very small pool of talking points that they can refer back to. Ace won't stop talking about emotionally hurting his opponents, Runt is always having a bad feeling, sometimes if you get lucky, the same voice clip starts looping over and over and over again without a way to stop it till the level ends. Hey Runt, I bet you a bag of chips that we have to stop that next fuel shipment. Abby, you'll have to stop that next fuel shipment. Hey Runt, I bet you a bag of chips that we have to stop that next fuel shipment. Abby, you'll have to stop that next fuel shipment. Back to the level proper, however, and we get what we need, leading us to a new ace level. This one shows off Ace's ability to use those beefy wings to toss explosive tomatoes to clear out the path. After that is a gauntlet of having to turn off these killer sprinkler systems to stop the plant growth. Do that four times and a quick run of enemies, and the level's over. If I had to say one thing about the ace levels, there's not enough big dumb set pieces. The chicken little levels in the last game threw stupid gimmick after stupid gimmick at you that was usually not good, but at the very least made one level distinct from the last. Here they kind of meld together, not enough to ruin it or anything, but just enough for me to notice how little I'm noticing it. Here we enter an elevator and- oh, dude, is that a gamer reference? Ah, oh, f*** yeah! I honestly didn't know what to do with myself when I saw this. If I had played this when I was younger, I would have been insufferable trying to explain this joke to my parents. So this is a game called Zero Wing, right? Is it good? No! At the bottom of the elevator is Lucy Goosey, who you may remember from the last video as being the reason I can't ever really be happy again. Well, in this game, you get to shoot at her, so it's up there for Game of the Year. Sadly, not only is it an Abby fight, but a puzzle boss as well. Goosey has a strong shield that makes her invulnerable to the hyper-advanced laser attacks, but woefully vulnerable to a wooden crate. You can only hurt her by dropping boxes onto her and then shooting her as she tries to retreat. Heavens forbid we do things the easy way, though, as not only are her attacks hard to dodge, but they come out really fast with high damage to make you fail at the last possible second. It's nothing I can't overcome, but things take a turn for the worse as we capture Goosey, but Foxy captures Abby in return. No more Abby levels! Oh, no. Foxy then contacts us with her demands. She wants control of the galaxy, or she'll use the moon that has been stuffed with explosives to destroy the Earth, and we have one hour to stop her. Last time I did this, I had three days! Oh, 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 yes, thank you, thank you, yes, uh, I, I, uh, you know, I guess I have played a video game before, yeah, what? So the moon is a bomb, and my to-do list has just gotten radically altered. We hightail to the moon and get our first mission with Runt. We have to disable the core of the moon by blowing it up, blowing up a bomb to stop it from blowing up. And what would you do, Point Dexter? This level introduces the only grunt enemy that's a threat to the tank, these weird snake fox robots whose standard attack is the super strong laser turret beam. Why aren't these the only foot soldiers you produce? To get to the core, we need to take out these sentry towers, but since their only weak spot is behind them and they track you wherever you go, you gotta use a teleporter to come from behind and blast them. Once we get to the core, we... I thought it would have been tougher, honestly. Next up is another ace level where we get the upgrade that lets you make Adam West make the weirdest noises of his entire life. <laughs> Here you're fighting the fox robots on foot, and if you thought they were hard to deal with with a tank, on foot they're tough as nails. They're basically the only enemy from now on, so you have to be constantly on the move to dodge when they bust out the laser. After riding a platform over, we get a platforming challenge where we need to hover, stick to the wall, and fight off waves of suicidal robots who take off a ton of health. The problem with this section is that walking on the walls inverts your controls in a super weird way. It's not just up is down and down is up, it's more like up is left if right is left, but only if Jupiter is in retrograde on the 4th of the month, and also the down key is now asterisk, but only on the number pad. Once we finally get past that, it's the toughest gauntlet in the game as you're swarmed by enemies on a narrow platform where they never stop spawning, while the only way to progress is by breaking this steel door. That of course leaves you as a sitting duck for anyone to come up and interrupt you. And in what is an incredibly funny joke, to anybody not forced to play it, behind the door is a second door, and behind that is yet another door that sets you on a time limit to either open it or be gored by a drill. We managed to get Abby back and chase Foxy off by throwing our only weapon away, and then we get sent off to catch her in Runt's tank, where she is in Metal Gear Rex. Not only are you tangling with Grimlock, but also waves of mole robots that waste plenty of your time by drilling underground and popping up where you aren't looking. The boss itself has a lot of hard-to-dodge attacks that need you to avoid them by never getting close to the boss in the first place. Of course, 
course, that makes it 10 times harder to hit with anything but your main blaster instead of your damage dealing sub weapons, but look on the bright side! You flat out can't avoid the laser attack, so it could be worse! It is worse! The final segment doesn't have you shooting at the mouth like before, instead you knock back and blow up a bomb to knock her off the edge of a cliff. Easier done than said, as I've just beaten her. Foxy gets sent tumbling to her death as Ace goes down for a victory lap on her corpse. Sadly, her corpse is still alive and she started piloting only the arm of the mech. My blaster can't do anything to her except when her brain stops working and she decides to stop being invincible from all my attacks. For some reason, this is the only part of the game where you're trapped in a permanent lock-on on the target. It's not bad, in fact, this is a really fun final boss, it's just weird how the changes made in this place of all places. You have to play jump rope, dodgeball, and third sport to stay alive and attack her when her shields are down. However, killing her twice isn't enough to stop her from detonating the moon anyway! Zulu. I said! We're on to the final level, but I know better, this is just last level 1 of 50, watch! We have to escape the exploding moon in Abby's ship. All you need to do is get to the end of the level without dying and flying through the rings to keep your boost up. There are health pickups all over the place, so you never have to worry about death. Just hold the boost for this extended victory lap. So the moon harmlessly explodes as Foxy crashes into our mothership, and we get that hot chicken-on-duck relationship we've been waiting for for the whole game! Oh look, Turkey Lurkey's getting in on it to make it a turducken! Not only is the whole universe saved, but more importantly, Chicken Little beat his game too! Pop the champagne! Game's good. <laughs>